morning. Welcome to Oakwood Community Church. Come on in and join us. Welcome to Oakwood Community Church. My name is Ted, and I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, it is an honor to be able to come and to worship together. And one of the most important messages that you will ever hear here is that God loves the world. And in the world is you. And the message of hope within the gospel, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so if you're here this morning and you've never heard the message of the hope of the gospel, it can change your life because of what God has done for us, giving his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. So I'm gonna welcome you here this morning and just give you a couple of announcements this morning. The first thing that I need to tell you is that if you are new here or never met the leadership 
at Oakwood Community Church. You can do that today in classroom one. We would love to meet you. There's usually some donuts there and some coffee uh, to be able to hang out and talk together and get to know uh, the leaders, and we'd love to get to know you. And so you're welcome uh, to come there, and we'd love to have you. Also, we want to um, just welcome, if you're a first-time guest, we have new bags. Um, they say welcome because you're important here. And so if you um, are a first-time guest, there are some things in there for you. Uh, in that welcome bag, you can pick that up at the guest kiosk. Uh, there are also four ways to give, and so I'm not going to say much about that, but encourage you to jump in and be a part of our giving. And so there's lots of opportunities uh, to do that on the app, online giving, cash check, or even text to give. And then wanted to make mention, I started a class just a couple weeks ago on a Wednesday night, and it's at our house. And if you would like to be a part of that class, it's called Rooted. And it's for those who are newer Christians and just want to learn more about the faith. Um, it's on Wednesday night, our house, six, um, 630, I think. And I don't even know what time it is. I just show up whenever the calendar says show up. And then at home, it's really nice because I'm there. Like when you show up, I'll be like, oh, yeah, we have rooted class. No, I'll prepare um, and be ready for you. And so we have a few people that have uh, jumped in and are a part of that. But we have room uh, for you. So if you'd like to do that, um, just come see me today. And we'd love for you to be a part of that. Um, and then the last thing that I want to mention is this Thursday, we have a grill and chill for the men. But as you know, I kind of pronounce it a little bit different. I say grill and chill for the men. All right, so that's at 6 o'clock, and that's at Jeff's house. Um, Bassinger, I didn't know if you said Basinger, Bassinger. It's all the same. Maybe not to Jeff. <laughs> it's the same to me, not to him. But um, that's Thursday, and that's at 6 o'clock. We'd love for you to have uh, to come out. Men, um, We this will be our third one, and I've been to all of them. I even came on my anniversary, uh, it's, and I know, is that good or bad? I made it up. I mean, we went out, we went away for the weekend, so that's how I got to come. Um, but it was, it was a good time. I'm digging myself deeper. I'll hang this up real quick. But I uh, would love that the, all the guys come, even if it's your anniversary. <laughs> Just kidding. That's really bad advice. But it's 6 o'clock. Bill. Yeah, you, you're meeting Wednesday with the men. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's Country Coney, Oxford. But did you guys see their name has changed? Now it's Omega something. So if you're looking for Country Coney... You're going to drive right by. I just noticed the sign is different. Um, and so somebody bought them out. Anyways, we're not here for that. Um, but I wanted to let you know that that is the place. Um, so I'd like to pray together. And then we're going to watch a video of our uh, SOS from Amplified Ministry just to thank you. So let's pray. Dear Father, we're so thankful for the time that we can come and we can gather together. Pray, Father, this morning that you would just calm our hearts, calm our minds. Father, if there's hurts or anxieties that are pressing into us this morning, pray that we would turn those over to you and knowing that you, as we cast all of our cares on you, you care for us. And we're so thankful that we can have a relationship with you. Thank you, Father, that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. And for the hope that we have, we rest in you. And just be with the rest of our time this morning as we listen to your word, as we worship together, that our hearts would be in tune with these songs, and that we would engage our hearts and minds in thinking and singing uh, to uh, praise and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Watch this video. Hey, my friends at Oakwood, I can't thank you guys enough for everything you've done here at Amplify Ministries up here in Flint. You guys have done so much. All the construction that you've had in the barn, including making it look pretty with all the flowers. We have a fire pit now. All the things that you've kind of given us a great start to getting this all done. So keep praying that everything goes well, especially for our, our Richfield Township. We got a couple board meetings we got to go to to get things approved. 
but I can't thank you enough again for all that you did for us. Thank you, and God bless. Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to his name, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's stand and praise him this morning. Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when.
They're all about grace. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to enter into our time of communion this morning. So if you haven't picked up the elements from the back, now would be a great time to go and do that. But before we jump in, I want to just set up before you why we practice communion in the first place. What is the point of practicing the Lord's Supper to come to the table? 
I think we lose sight of it really easily. It just becomes this thing we do, this thing that we go to church, oh, first Sunday of the month, we're going to do communion. I want to remind you guys that the Lord's Supper reminds us that Jesus' payment for our sin has been accomplished. So we should come to the table with joy and with reverence and with sorrow for what our sins did. But again, with joy that Jesus paid it all. We're reminded that Christ died for us, but that we get the full benefit of Christ's death on the cross. We proclaim that Jesus is the bread of our life when we pick up that piece of bread. And with his blood we say, Jesus, your blood paid the price for my sin. You paid it. You paid the price. We're reminded of the suffering of Christ on our behalf. That our sins were the reason that his body was broken and that his blood was spilled. Our sins. So that we can enjoy forgiveness and fellowship with him. Church, don't take this lightly. Don't make this a routine. Don't come to the table lightly. This is a a beautiful picture that we get to come and celebrate and take part in this morning. Don't take it lightly. Paul says this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat the bread and drink without discerning of the the discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. I want to give us right now a moment to reflect. Is there any sin that you know is in your heart that you need to confess? Anything that you need to give to the Lord and, and seek reconciliation or forgiveness on? Take a moment now and, and let's take him to the Lord. Apostle Paul writes this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Let's pray. Father God, we're so grateful for Jesus, for the body that was broken and beaten, bruised and battered on our behalf, Father. Lord, that he was willing to endure not just the the physical suffering of the cross, Lord, but through your wrath for our sins. God, may we never take that lightly or take that for granted. God, I pray that you would help us um, eating this bread to remember that and to treasure that sacrifice that you made. Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Or take the bread. He goes on to write this. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray a blessing over the cup. Father God, we're so unbelievably grateful and in awe of the blood of Christ that was poured on our behalf, Lord. The blood that washes our sins as white as snow. What a mystery, God. And I just, again, just pray that you would help us to remember it and treasure it and think about it and meditate on it, Lord. Would you help us to to honor the blood that was spilt on our behalf? We're so grateful for it. We just ask that you would um, help us to remember it and be in awe of it, Lord. So we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Then partake of the cup. He goes on to say this, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray one last time. God, we're so grateful for the body and blood of Christ because we know that body and blood of our Savior means our forgiveness. Our sins have been washed away, God, and we're just so grateful of that. God, thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us on our behalf, just to purchase our forgiveness and fellowship with you. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the rest of our time together this morning, that you'd help us to continue to be reminded of that amazing truth. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. continue our worship together. Your 
grace that leads the sinner home from death to life forever and sings the song of righteousness by blood and not by merit your grace that Your grace that I cannot explain, not by my earthly wisdom, the Prince of Life without a stain was traded for this grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is the gift of God all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing praise
Good morning. Go ahead and turn me down a little bit, Bill, because I can tell it's a little too hot. So good to see you this morning during the middle of summer. Well, I got to catch up. I know we're all going and doing our own things and gathering again on Sunday, so it's good to see you. Uh, Julie and I just served at Barrichell from uh, Monday through Friday and spoke to teenagers. It was really special that Julie got to speak to the girls uh, one of the nights while I spoke to the boys, and so we had a, just a really effective week. Those of you who pray for us while we travel and minister, we thank you for that. Continue to do so. I'll be speaking tomorrow at Spring Arbor University, uh, SSI, Student Something Institute, um, Student Statesman Institute, thank you. I should know what I'm doing and where I'm going, right? Uh, I do know I gotta be at uh, Spring Arbor University at six o'clock tomorrow night, so be praying for that uh, one time just message. And then just so you got a feel for the rest of our summer, Pastor Ted will be preaching at summertime. Gotta get some of these guys up here. Pastor Ted will be preaching next Sunday, and then Cole has a two-week series. I'm excited for him to have two weeks. And wasn't it fun to have Cole lead us in communion today? Wasn't that great? It's good to see him serving. All the things he's led, uh, he's been with us in baptism and then got to lead communion, and so it's fun. To, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy hearing him preach again uh, two weeks after Ted preaches next week. We're going to jump into a series today, but then I'm not going to be able to get back into it until August. So um, we're going to start it, and then you'll have to remember, okay? That's going to be hard, isn't it? It's going to be a couple of weeks difference, uh, but we're going to start it today, and then I'll finish this series. I don't know if it'll be two more weeks or just one more week, uh, but we will uh, cover the book of Jude. It's a tiny little book. Just got one chapter, so when we talk about Jude and I tell you to go to a verse, don't worry about what chapter. There's no chapters. It's just go to this verse, uh, and we're going to spend some time looking at Jude. Today is just an introduction for this wonderful, tiny book with a powerful message. And the message is for us as believers to stand firm, hold fast to the true faith. And Jude was dealing with a, a problem of false teaching entering into the church. Our worst enemy is not outside. <laughs> you need to remember that. Our worst enemy is not the world who doesn't know God. We're fully aware of that and we're prepared for that. What really gets the church is when from the inside false teaching takes a root. And so Jude was trying to stomp out false teachers. That's why we're using the term wolves. Our lion's missing because I didn't want to mix lions and wolves today. We'll be changing out the decor after our book of Daniel and moving forward for the rest of our summer. But we're in Jude. If you want to open up there and get ready, you know when we start a new book, you guys love it. We get to see a cartoon, right? Are you ready for our cartoon intro to the book of Jude? Let's see it. Roll that video, please. The letter of Jude, or more accurately, Judah, according to the pronunciation of his name, both in Greek and in Hebrew. Judah was one of Jesus' four brothers who are named in the gospel accounts. None of the brothers followed Jesus as the Messiah before his death, but afterwards they saw him alive from the dead and then became his disciples. All these brothers of Jesus became leaders eventually in the first Jewish Christian communities, and Judah was known as a traveling teacher and missionary. And this gives us the background to understand the purpose of his letter. We don't know what specific church community he wrote to, but it was likely made up of mostly Messianic Jews. His writing style assumes a deep knowledge of the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures, as well as other popular Jewish literature. Jude had become aware of a crisis facing this church, and so this helps us understand the letter's design. It begins with an opening charge, followed by a long warning and accusation against corrupt teachers who had influenced this church. And then Judah closes by completing the charge about what this church is supposed to do. 
Judah begins by charging this church to contend for the true Christian faith. He says his plan was to write a longer work that explored our shared salvation through the Messiah. But that project, he says, got delayed when he heard the urgent news about this church, and so he fired off this very thoughtful but very short letter. Judah doesn't begin with how they're supposed to contend for the faith. Rather, he first goes into why. It's because of the corrupt teachers who have infiltrated this church. And it's not their teaching that he targets, but their way of life. Their moral compromise is what tells you they have bad theology. First of all, they've distorted God's grace as a license to sin. They think that they're forgiven and they have God's spirit, so now they can do whatever they want, especially when it comes to money and sex. And so Judah says they betray Jesus by rejecting his authority and his teachings. And Judah wants this church to know that the appearance of these teachers is no surprise. He transitions into a longer warning to stay away from them. He first offers two sets of three Old Testament examples. The first trio is about rebellious people who in the past received divine justice. So the Israelites who rebelled against God in the wilderness, they got what they wanted and they died out in the middle of nowhere. Then he brings up a story about angels who are imprisoned for rebellion until they face God's justice. He's referring to the interpretation of the story in Genesis 6 offered in the popular Jewish work called First Enoch, where the sons of God are interpreted to refer to angels who rebelled against God, then had sex with women and were judged accordingly. Judah links this story to his third example about the ruin of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis, where violent men tried to have sex with angels. Both these stories are about rebellion against God's order that led to sexual immorality. And that's precisely what the corrupt teachers are guilty of. After this, Judah brings up a bonus example from a popular Jewish text called the Testament of Moses. Like Enoch, it was not part of the Old Testament scriptures, and it was a creative retelling of Moses' final days and words based on Deuteronomy. In the section that Judah quotes from, Moses has died, and there's a good angel, Michael, who is refuting the devil's accusations against Moses, but he decides to leave final judgment for God alone. Now, these stories might seem kind of odd to you, but for Jewish people who were raised on this literature, Judah's warnings make good sense. The behavior of these corrupt teachers has ancient roots, rebellion against God's authority, sexual immorality, rejecting God's messengers. And this connects to the second trio of examples. They're all about rebels who went on to corrupt other people. So Cain, he murdered his brother, but then he went on to build a city where violence reigned. Balaam, the sorcerer, he couldn't curse Israel, and so he lured them into idolatry and sexual corruption. And then Korah, the Levite, he led a rebellion against Moses that ended in disaster for others. Judah concludes the second trio with a barrage of Old Testament images to describe the teachers. They're like the selfish shepherds of Ezekiel, or like the clouds with no rain from Proverbs, or like the chaotic waves from Isaiah. Their self-absorption betrays their claim to follow Jesus. They create chaos wherever they go. Judah concludes his warning by quoting from two other warnings, one ancient and one recent. The first comes, again, from the popular book of First Enoch, which claimed to contain the visions of the ancient figure Enoch from the book of Genesis. Now, what's fascinating is Judah quotes from the opening chapter of Enoch, which is itself quoting about half a dozen Old Testament texts about the final day of the Lord's justice on human evil. Judah then matches Enoch's ancient warning with a more recent one from the Apostles. Peter, John, Paul, they all predicted that corrupt teachers would arise and distort the good news about Jesus. And they themselves were echoing Jesus' early warning about the same thing. And so this church should need no more convincing. These teachers have to be dealt with. So Judah then moves into his closing charge. He picks up his opening line about contending for the faith, and he unpacks how to do so with a cool set of metaphors. He describes the community of Jesus as God's new temple. And so they are to build their lives on the foundation of the most holy faith, which refers to the core message of good news about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for our sins. On that foundation, the church is to build itself through a dedication to prayer by devoting itself to the love of God through obedience. And the integrity of this building will be maintained by staying alert for the return of Jesus to bring his justice and his mercy. And in doing this, they will help each other stay faithful to Jesus. Judah then concludes by praising the God who will protect his people and keep them from falling too far from his grace.
The short letter of Judah is powerful and puzzling for many modern readers who ask why he quotes from texts that aren't today considered part of the Hebrew Bible, like First Enoch or the Testament of Moses. It's important to remember that Jewish culture in this time was immersed in religious texts. Jesus, his family, all the early Jewish Christians grew up reading the Hebrew Bible along with many later books that were based on and inspired by the scripture. And we know there were ancient debates about whether or not some of these later books should be viewed as scripture, but regardless, they're still important. A book doesn't have to be in the Bible to speak an important message to God's people. And so we have many Jewish texts from this period. They're known today as the collections of the Apocrypha, also called the Deuterocanon, along with the Pseudepigrapha. These were all preserved and read in Jewish and Christian communities. They were treated with great respect. It doesn't mean they were originally designed as part of the Hebrew Bible, but they are part of the biblical tradition. And so Judah, knowing his readers that they would value words from First Enoch, he used them to communicate his message, which is this. God's grace through Jesus demands a whole life response, not just intellectual assent. Notice that Judah doesn't criticize or focus on the teacher's theology, but their immoral way of life, which denies Jesus. And so Judah is here applying what Jesus first told his disciples. If you really love me, then you will obey my teachings. For Christians, how you live is the most reliable indicator of what you actually believe. And that's what the letter of Jude is all about. Confused? It's a small book. It's a short book. And yet I think for many Christians today that you get confused right away. Uh, my wife was even saying, oh, this is crazy stuff. Um, this book of Enoch. And the, listen, I want to reemphasize what the video said. Uh, there are books that are good and they're helpful. Even today, we just finished Bodie Bachman's book, great book called Fault Lines. If you're looking for a good read this summer, tough, hard read, deep read, uh, but it's well done. Good book, but not the good book. We do need to understand that, right? You did get that. I mean, they did say those other writings were beneficial, helpful, good. They use words like that. But very clearly, I want to make sure you understand today that what we have here is the word of God, inspired, infallible, and those are what we should study and look to. Some Christians like to go to the Apocrypha or the Pseudepigrapha and read from there. Cool, fine, not Bible, okay? Just make sure we get that clear today. Helpful, just like Vody Bachman's book, or if you read Francis Chan or anyone else that you read about, um, uh, good and helpful books for Christians, but not the Holy Scriptures, amen? Just so we're clear with that. Then the other thing that just kind of drives me nuts is the four brothers of Jesus, and they listed them, and the names weren't right, because they, they get all fancy. Sometimes people are smarter than they, they need to be. We know that James is the brother of Jesus. You didn't see his name there. Some of you should have said, where's James? Well, the word Joseph there, and you do some work, and that's James. And so we're more familiar with it, which brings us to the first verse where Jude says, Jude, a servant of Jesus and a brother of James. So I hate it when they throw different names on the screen, but it's the same people. James is a brother uh, of Jesus, so is Judah, okay? just so I, That one just drove me nuts because it's on the screen. So let's get going. We'll get into this book of Judah. I'm only doing four verses today, uh, a couple verses to get us started, and then we'll come back. We'll circle around in August and do more work. So let's get into it, the book of Jude. Pray with me. Let's start by praying. Would you say this prayer? Just say, God, since there's something you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. Just give that prayer to God. God, since there's something you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. To listen. And God, we do pray that you would be glorified and that everyone hearing this message would be edified and that Satan would be horrified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jude. Key thoughts. Just walk through a little bit of what they already told us. The main thing about the book of Jude is for us, believers, to contend for the faith. Now, right away, we start with a concerning word, contend. Some of you might look at that word and think of a prize boxer, and you're thinking, that's right, let's go pick a fight. 
I don't think that's necessarily what was meant by contend for the faith. But by all means, we who are true followers of Jesus, we ought to be prepared to defend our position of sound faith and sound doctrine. That doesn't mean we go on Facebook and tell everybody in the world that they're wrong and only you are right. Uh, Don't pick a fight. Don't be angry. Don't be mean. Because the Bible also tells us uh, to always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have within you, but do so with gentleness and respect. So in the Bible, we're always talking about the, the book upside down. It's, 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 it's a kingdom upside down, right? The last will be first, the first will be last. Contend for the faith, but do so with gentleness and respect, right? Not like the world would think about fighting or contending. But he tells us to be prepared. So we need to prepare ourselves. And then he goes on to say, watch out for wolves. So the analogy and the imagery for this whole series is about wolves in sheep clothing. Our only problem with our image is that wolf looks really cute. (laughs) He really looks more like a sheep. And I guess that's what's so dangerous about wolves within the church, false teachers within the, it looks good. Close enough. Don't worry about those sharp teeth. (laughs) He's cute. He's fluffy. He won't hurt you. No, we have to watch out. For the wolves, false teachers. And then build your faith strong. You heard in there, that's one of our goals. As believers, we got to build on a solid foundation. Are you prepared to defend what you believe? Or do you not know what you believe and you'll be easily tossed about in the waves? And so we got to build a strong faith on a right foundation. Be merciful, you'll find toward the very end of the book, he says, be merciful to those who doubt. So there are some that just don't agree. Be merciful. Let's not pick a fight. They don't believe yet. So we continue to to talk about what's true, but be merciful, but direct. And then finally, praise God for persevering. It's it's God. It is God who promises that I will complete the good work that I started in you. And so we ought to be thankful. I don't want you to think that you've got to uh, somehow miraculously on your own strength contend for the faith. No, it's God who works in you and he wills in you uh, to preserve you. So those are the key thoughts coming from the book of Jude. Now let's, see, he is kind of cute, isn't he? Should have had a picture with his teeth. Let's walk through verse by verse. Read with me. Jude 1, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. It's amazing, in verse 1, Jude calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. If I was his brother, I would use that right away. I would go right to that. Hey, everybody, it's Jude, brother of Jesus. Woohoo, Jude. Uh, instead, it's very interesting that Jude calls himself a servant, a slave of Jesus. And then a brother of James. He, he indicates his family lineage there. He's a brother of James. And it's written to us or to believers, to those who have faith in Christ, specifically back then, maybe the Messianic Jews who gathered, um, but to those who've been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. That's your introduction. We know who it's from. We know who he is. Had to be hard growing up as a brother of Jesus. Can you imagine that? I just, I mean, the Moors, I got three more boys sitting there. I mean, can you imagine if Spencer was God's only son? Wouldn't it be a pain growing up with Spencer? Every time the lamp gets broke, Spencer did it. No, he didn't. <laughs> ah, never can, can, can never blame Spencer for anything, right? So here's growing up in, in Jesus' family. Had to be rough on them. And it's interesting that they did not, the brothers did not believe in Jesus as God's son and savior of the world. They didn't. They struggled with that. I would too. I would have a hard time believing that in my own house, I grew up with somebody of deity. It's, a, it's a really amazing. You know what changed everything? It changes everything for you and for me, and it changed everything for James and Judah. Jesus died, and he rose again from the dead, and they saw him and spoke to him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. I could see being a brother of Jesus and doubting until he walks out of that tomb. And you're like, (gasps) whoa, he's not making this up. It's true, everything that we've heard. And so their lives were changed. And each of them, 
went on to, to, to be a servant of Jesus after his death and resurrection uh, and went on to preach for him. And then we go to verse 2. We hear about mercy, peace, and love. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. I know it's just a, a greeting, and you might think there's just like, um, you know, hello, great family of Oakwood. I, I, every time I write you a letter, it's like, hello, great family, right? You hear that? And we might just pass right over that. It's just a greeting, um, you know, salutations. You know I mean, uh, it, but it's something we should think about for a second. Those three words are very important. Mercy. We are people deeply in need of mercy. Again, you understand the difference between grace and mercy, right? Grace is getting something that you don't deserve. That's salvation, rich and free. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve, which is our sins make us accountable, but Jesus set us free and paid that price. So by his mercy, we don't get what we do deserve. So he mentions mercy, and then it brings peace. I love how he brought that up first. Mercy, then peace. Isn't peace what we want? How many of you would raise your hand today and say, I want peace in my family. I want peace at work. I want peace in this world. I want peace. Yes, we desire peace. We find out that it only comes from grace and mercy. But it's something you can experience. In the book of Philippians, it talks about a peace that passes all understanding. It doesn't make sense. It's hard to explain. And here's Judah saying, mercy, peace. And then above all things, what? Love. Everybody say love. love. I'm not going to pick a fight with Ted. He's been here long enough. We don't say John 3, 16 like that. Did any of you catch that? Yeah. He said, for God so love the world. What? How do we say it, Oakwood? For God so loved the world. Yeah, sorry, Ted, just picking on you. It's just inflection, I know. It didn't change anything from the Holy Scripture, but it puts it in the right context. For God so loved the world. I'm glad he didn't just love it. It's not like he was talking to God saying, oh, I love the world and I love pizza. Let's order pizza. No, no, no. You can love pizza. You can love motorcycles. You can love lakes. You can love mountains. But this is different. For God so loved that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So mercy, peace, and love be yours. And he could have just ended it there. But he said, in abundance. Isn't that good? Overflowing. We have mercy, peace, and love to, sh to, to share. <laughs> There's enough that if you give all yours away, you'll have more. It's a beautiful thing. That's verse two. And then let's go to verse three. He says, dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. There's the theme of the book. He wanted to write about salvation and just talk about their shared joy and what we have, and yet he he realizes there's a problem in the church. Within the church, people are teaching false things. Now listen, we're going to get into this. We're going to talk about it, but be careful. I'm afraid a lot of people come to the book of Jude, and they're, they're like, they have their belief about a lot of stuff. And, and, and they'll say, if somebody disagrees with me, the book of Jude is there to tell them that they're wrong. They're the wolves because they don't agree with me. Well, I mean, if you've got some weird thought about end times and you're telling everybody it's God's biblical truth, I mean, you know, I don't think we're talking about those peripheral issues here. Matter of fact, Jude makes it pretty clear we're talking about the core, the core things about salvation. What we need to talk about is what people do to add to salvation. People add to they add qualifications. We saw that in this time frame because uh, while Judah's writing, they're still struggling with the Jewish believers who had to be circumcised. And now new believers, Gentiles, are coming into the church and they're like, you got to be circumcised. Now, if you don't know what circumcision is, go talk to Pastor Ted. He'll fill you in. He'll explain all those things. But I'm going to move right on. And so that was, Paul come along and says, what are you trying to add? You're adding a heavy weight and a burden that's not part of true salvation. Yet God did require the Jews in the Old Testament to be circumcised as a sign 
Today we have baptism. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you for that sign. But what do people do today? People will come along and say, baptism is for your salvation. You get saved in the water. That's adding something that the Bible does not say. We don't get saved by going through the waters of baptism. That is an act of obedience. The Bible tells us that we should be baptized. The Bible shows us that Jesus himself was baptized. But it is not contingent for your salvation. Communion. People do the same thing over the elements. They confuse the ordinances of baptism and communion and they make them sacramental. They make them sacerdotal. They make them part of salvation. Some people teach that you must take Holy Communion regularly in order to be saved. Some would even say you better have Holy Communion before you die or you won't go to heaven. That's adding to what the gospel tells us is true about salvation. Again, I remind you of the thief on the cross. Remember the thief on the cross? And he went from mocking Jesus to realizing he was the son of God. All he did was understand and put his faith that he believed that Jesus was the son of God. And what did Jesus say to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. As far as we know, he never got baptized. As far as we, never, as far as we know, he never had communion. We shouldn't add requirements. And I think that's... Part of what he's getting at here today in this passage is let's, let's talk about not, not your weird thoughts. And if somebody doesn't agree with you, I hope you don't do that. I love Oakwood. We're non-denominational. People come from all sorts of backgrounds. Some of you bring in baggage and your thoughts and your theology and your end times beliefs and all those things. You know what? We don't make a big deal about the small stuff, right? Uh, don't sweat the petty stuff and don't pet the sweaty stuff. That's how we... We're going to get along. We get along fine. Christians have all sorts of thoughts and ideas. But listen, on the one thing that I will contend for is the gospel. And I will not be part of a church and preach as part of a church that adds requirements to salvation that simply aren't there. That's number one. That's where we'll contend. You say, well, a person has to speak in tongues in order to show that and prove that they're saved. And I say, no. I say, don't add requirements to the gospel. There's all sorts of things that we've done over time. And it's a shame as we look at all the many denominations of confusion now that we have, the separation and all the arguments. We need to know what the basic true elements of our faith are, amen? amen. Now we can have thoughts. I'm not discouraging if you're having your thoughts on studying end times or, or studying a communion and baptism. But uh, again, the Bible says on a lot of those issues, keep them to yourself. Keep them between you and the Lord. Don't make it for everybody else has to believe it as a test of fellowship. We don't do that. Rod, I don't know what kind of pizza you like, but I love you, brother. Don't even tell me what kind of pizza. It might, it might affect that. I like me some deep dish Chicago pizza. That's my favorite. Mm. You might like that Detroit style that you think is deep dish. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you might like that New York thing that you can fold up, make a pizza taco out of. I don't know. But I love deep dish Chicago pizza. But I'm not going to make it a test of fellowship. And do the same when it comes to your weird thoughts. Okay? I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Do the same with your very minutia thoughts on topics and various subjects, except if it comes to the gospel. I care about two things mainly. What do you do with Jesus Christ? What do you do with the Holy Scriptures? Those are essentials. But by the way, you can find out a cult. If you, if you want to know how to discover what a cult is, ask, what do you do with Jesus? What do you do with the Bible? And if they're adding more Scripture to the Bible than we have, that's, that's not good. Don't allow that. Scripture, Jesus, those are the key things. And then we get along, as Scripture would teach us. So we're going to talk more about that. Now, the second aspect of false beliefs is not only were they adding requirements to salvation that weren't true and that were a burden for people to bear, but they were also then uh, making a mockery out of Jesus' death resurrection by saying we've got forgiveness so we can do what we want. You know, grace, Right? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? There were teachers that were actually teaching, get out there and sin. Because God's grace covers sin. And if you're not out there sinning, 
Jesus doesn't get any work done. <laughs> it's kind of, that's a short version of that, but it's so distorted, it sounds ridiculous. But there were people saying, go sin, because the more you sin, the more grace will abound. We want grace, don't we? What? No, no, friends, let me tell you, those people that led people to sinful lifestyles, simply abusing grace, it's wrong. Now, we don't earn our salvation by obeying God, but as believers who accept his glorious salvation, it changes us from the inside out. Remember, at the time of salvation, God unzips you and sticks in the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit is not going to let you just run in disobedience. And worldly living, no, the Holy Spirit will convict and enlighten Scripture. And so we have all that we need to live a holy life, not for our salvation, but because we are the saved. Kingdom people live differently, amen? We live differently. And so don't step on the glorious gift of salvation. Trample on it by making light of it. So those, are, I think, are the two aspects he's talking about, not those silly things that we go carrying on about. And then four, oh, no, I guess three. I'm just doing one through three today, I lied. Yes, because then we go on to the next time I come, I will talk in more in specific about these wolves. But today I thought I would just end by making sure we have this right. And you can never accuse the pastor of saying, we've heard this before. <laughs> because if we're going to talk about what the gospel is, I want to make it clear. So I'm going to go over the gospel again. Some of you are like, we heard this. Didn't we hear this at Easter? I hope you did. And I hope you hear it every week. We as Christians ought to preach the gospel to ourselves over and over and over again. I'll go quickly because I know that we've heard this, but maybe perhaps there's somebody here today that hasn't heard this and they need to hear it. And so we believe in a couple of things called facts, faith, forgiveness. Everybody say facts. Everybody say faith. faith. Forgiveness. Three things. Number one, facts. And these are the bare bone facts. Number one, God is holy. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. God is holy. What is holy? Absolute purity, perfection, and righteousness. There is no imperfection in God, and we must start there. Because Genesis 1-1 says, for in the beginning, God. Stop right there. That's what you need to know. In the beginning, God. Who is this God? Number one, he's a holy God. You've heard me explain how the angels cry out, holy, holy, holy. They triplicate that one word, and you never do that. In their language, they would double it. Remember I talked about the pit? And if you're going to fall into a pit, and I say, watch out, Bill, there's a pit pit. That means there's a really big pit. So it was common to double a word, but you never triple the word. If I said, Bill, there's a pit pit pit, Bill's going to say, Slow your roll, it's just a pit pit. You know, you're going crazy there. But the angels couldn't help themselves. They cried out, oh, he's holy, holy. Let's do one more. Holy! He's holy, holy, holy. And so that becomes a fact that we start with. I know we all want to start with God is love. But the fact is that our God is holy and he's going to demand justice. You need to understand this. Because God is holy, no sin is going to enter into heaven. God is holy, and number two is I'm not. <laughs> so we, we start with a problem. We start with a holy God, but that becomes our problem because I'm not. I am a sinner. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you know my definition of all. All means all. That's all. All means, amen? So there's no caveat here. All those other people, no. All those worldly people, no. All have sinned. I'm a sinner from birth. I was born with the sin problem. Some of you get, have a hard time with that. That's, oh, that's just not fair. I was born with a sin problem because I came from Don Jackson Sr. And he was a sinner. And his daddy was a sinner. And his daddy was, I come from a long line of fallen heathen sinners. I was born with a sin problem. But I also chose sin. The true reality is not only are we born with a sin problem, a propensity to sin, but we are sinners by nature. And so we eventually choose. We don't have to argue about that. If you don't believe me, I dare you to go work in the nursery. <laughs> uh, it's the greatest proof that all people are born with a sin problem. No child is, I've never sat down with a two-year-old and said, you know, you really need to think about yourself more. Never had to do that with a two-year-old. 
They got this selfish thing going on. It's coming from deep within them. You take their toy, you're going to get it. And they let you know, I'm not happy. I mean, if they could speak, we would hear it screaming through the walls. I'm not happy. Problem is, some of us never grow out of that. And you're still sitting there. I'm not happy. We're sinners from birth, but then we prove it by our own actions. Number three. Jesus is God's son. Now we get to the good news of Jesus. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he goes on to say, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. For those in the world who would say Jesus was a good teacher, but that was it, he was just a man, Jesus himself claimed to be God's son. He did it clearly here. And so you need to know the facts from Scripture is that God is holy, I am not. Thank goodness his son Jesus Christ came. Jesus is God's son. Not only is he God's son, but Jesus lived a sinless life. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's a fact that we need to understand. Jesus is our only hope for righteousness. You don't have it on your own. Matter of fact, in Philippians, I just preached Philippians at Barakel all week. I went through the whole book. Good news for you, you're going to get it uh, after my Jude series. We're going to do the Philippians series. And in Philippians, he gives a, uh, some of you might think, a horrible illustration about our sinfulness. He talks about the filthy rags. All of, his, all of Paul's wonderful accomplishments and his hereditary, her, her, what is it? He, no, uh, his long line of from his line of lineage, what is it? Hereditary. Hereditary credentials. Paul had them all. And he says they all were filthy rags when he added all of his stuff that he had. Religiosity. And those filthy rags, by the way, were not garbage. He says, I count them as garbage, we have in English. That doesn't do justice to what the word was. It actually referred more to um, you could call it dung. What's a better way to call it? Poop. We'll call it poop. But even that doesn't quite do it. I pick up garbage at my house, you know. My son can't do it. My son learned early on. He got that gag reflex. And my son, I say, take out the trash. He'll go to the garbage can. He'll go, oh, come on, Josh. I can't do it, Dad. I can't do it. He gags. Come on. It's just garbage. We got a dog, so we got lots of poop. Every once in a while, I got to pick up the poop, scoop the poop. That's not that bad. Paul actually talked about garbage in the sense of medical waste. These rags that he's talking about, this pile of filthy rags, insinuate a couple of things. Okay, this is going to get gross. Just hang on. Menstrual rags after a woman's period. Rags that covered festering wounds. Thank you, Pastor Don. Blood and pus. That's what we're talking about here. And those are what the rags are covered in that Paul is talking about. So you need to know that when you stand before a holy God someday, you got to wear something. And according to Paul and according to what we know in Scripture, that when we stand before a holy God with all of our credentials, all of our hereditary stuff, all the stuff that we can come and say, look at me, I'm so spiritual, we're dressed in filthy rags. Can you just picture that? But Jesus is in a robe of righteousness. So the only way I'm getting into heaven is if I can discard those filthy rags and acquire a righteous robe, amen? Are you still carrying your rags or have you exchanged them for a righteous robe of Jesus? When God asks me who's paying for the sin, I'm going to say, I ask Jesus to forgive me and save me. And at that moment, Jesus, God's not going to look at Don Jackson and all his filthy rags. He's going to look at Jesus and see that pure, white robe of righteousness. And he's going to say, Don Jackson, you're perfect and pure. Wow. That's an amazing exchange. And it's only available because Jesus lived a sinful life. You see, he wasn't born with a sin problem. Some of you might say, why do we believe in that thing about Jesus being born of a virgin? It's a, an essential doctrine. Because if he was just Joseph's son, he would have gotten that sin problem that we all are born with. And he would have ended up acting on it. 
but not our Savior. He was born of God, not of Joseph. So he didn't have that. Fully man, but fully God, no sin. And he chose never to sin. Our Savior is sinless, amen? amen? And then we come to the fact that Jesus died for our sins. In 1 Peter, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in his body, but made alive in his spirit. Jesus went to the cross sinless, but he died with yours and my sin so that he can give us that robe of righteousness. That's mercy. That's grace. All in one moment, what Jesus did for us on the cross. And he did die. He didn't swoon. He didn't pass out and then miraculously come revive. No, he died. The Bible makes it very clear. He died for our sins. And not only that, today he is alive and seated with God. Romans 8, 34. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. It's a beautiful thing to know that Jesus is there at the right hand of God, praying for us, helping us pray, interceding our prayers to God himself. He's alive. We don't have a martyred Savior. We have a risen Savior. Amen? Amen. These are the facts. But I'll give you a warning. Just hearing these facts or even saying, ah, yeah, I get those facts, doesn't save you. Just plain facts won't save you. I remind you in James 2.19, it says, even the demons believe and tremble. The demons aren't saved, but they know all these things are true. The devil knows God is holy. The devil understands about sin. The devil knows that Jesus was God's son, that God sent here because he so loved the world. He knows all those facts. He knows that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. All those facts are guaranteed knowledge of evil demons, but they're not saved. What do you do with the facts? That's why we move from facts to faith. Everybody say faith. Do you have faith? Faith, by God's grace alone, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It's a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We don't earn salvation is what we're trying to be taught here. We don't earn it by our good deeds. It's a gift from God. God's grace is a gift. Did you know your faith? That You might say, well, yeah, I have great faith. Well, it's a gift from God. God gives us two gifts. All people, all believers get two gifts. One is faith and one is suffering. Some of you are like, how do I return that second gift? <laughs> no. No, we'll talk about that in Philippians. We'll get there. But faith is a gift. And if you have faith, thank God. Thank God that you believe. It's by grace alone. And faith also is received through Christ alone. John 1, 12 Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. It's through faith. That's why that criminal on the cross who never went to church, never got to Sunday school, never sang in the choir, never had to work in the nursery, never got communion, never got baptized, never probably gave a cent, he ended up in paradise. And you know Alistair Begg's version of that story. That's my favorite, one of my favorite Alistair Begg sermons when he talked about the, when that criminal on the cross, died on that cross moments after faith and ends up before God at the Holy... Can you imagine the intake? Whoever's working intake at the Holy Gates, who are you? Nobody, really. Well, how did you get here? I don't, I don't know. I just, well, did, 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 did you serve in the church? No, no I, never, I never actually went to church. <laughs> did, you, did you give money for missions? Was this a giving thing? No, I never gave a dime. Matter of fact, I kind of got killed for stealing, you know. <laughs> what makes you think that you can come in here? And, and the guy just simply looks and says, listen, I have no idea, but the guy on the middle cross told me to come. Listen, that's all you need. The man on the middle cross says, if you believe, come. And that's important. Faith. Are you all in? My illustration of there is a chair and fully sitting on a chair. So faith is essential. The Bible says it's by faith. It's through faith alone, Acts 16, 31. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe, faith. 
And that's essential. So do you know the facts? Everybody say facts. It's good to know the facts, but have you, are you all in on those facts? Are you saying, I believe, and I put my faith and trust in that? That's faith. I'd warn you, though, the Bible tells us about empty faith. James talks a lot about a dead faith. What? Well, it's, it's a faith that isn't producing any fruit. I, I'd be careful, and I just would warn you. I, I do believe that God answers the prayer of a sinner and will save them. But I do believe at times people are confused, and they think if they say a magic prayer, then they're saved. And it goes to these false teachers who would go on to say, all right, you got your get out of hell free card, now go live your life, have fun, do what you want. And that's, that's distorting the truth of the gospel and grace. An empty faith and a dead faith means that there was nothing there. You see, we're born in our sins, which means we're dead in our sins. The Bible says spiritually you're dead. Remember Nicodemus? You must be born again. Because you don't have spiritual life. Nicodemus is confused. I think I'm sucking air for free. Yeah, you're alive physically, but you're dead spiritually. So your spiritual side must be born, come to life. And the problem is so many people just are counting on, I said the magic prayer. I went forward to an altar. I don't know how it works, but for some it means nothing. There was no saving grace in that. It didn't change their lives. It's a dead faith. There's no fruit. I'm not judging. I'm just a fruit inspector. And the Bible says you're not saved by works, but if you don't have works, then you're dead. The Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so apparently we need to talk about this because I believe this is what part of what Jude was Combating is this maybe easy believism and, and not regeneration, not new birth. Some people come and say, yeah, I'll add a little Jesus to my life. Dualistic theology, like, yeah, sure, I'll add Jesus and whatever else. You know, I got to have all my good luck charm. And that won't cut it. Go back to faith. It's grace alone, everybody say alone. It's Christ alone, everybody say alone. It's faith alone, everybody say alone. Uh, the sola, sola scriptura, sola Cristo, sola faith, fide. Grace alone, Christ alone, faith alone. So you don't just add. It's like, I want to add a little Jesus seasoning to your life. Listen, you don't add a little Jesus seasoning to what you got going on. You need a whole new recipe, right? And so I'm afraid that, that this part of what we're dealing with is this empty be faith, believism, do what you want kind of a life. And that's, that doesn't bear truth. We've got facts. Everybody say facts. We've got faith. Everybody say faith. But forgiveness is essential. Everybody say forgiveness. It's a promise from God. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I know that verse was written to believers about our continual righteousness, sanctification. We can take our sins to him. But it's true for anybody who comes and offers their sinful life. They'll take those rags and give them a robe of righteousness. It's a promise from God, and it's absolutely necessary. Open your Bibles. I think they're putting them all on the screen today because it's important stuff. But um, in Luke 13, verse 3, it says, I tell you no. That's important there. Get those punctuations. I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Everybody say repent. repent. There is a component. Your sins must be forgiven. Again, you're going to stand before a holy God who's going to want to know who's paying for the sin. All right, have you dealt with the sin issue? Yes, you go to the Lord and you ask him to forgive you. Yes, that's prayer. But there's no magic prayer. I, I kind of try to avoid doing a pray after me scenario I, as a pastor. It's, it's easy. Sometimes you can do that. Helpful to people, but you need to do it in your own words, through your own heart and mind. And it needs to encompass something like this. God, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and come into my life as Savior and Lord. Have you had that moment where you've asked God in your own words to forgive you of your sins? By faith, it's by faith, but your sins need to be forgiven. Forgiveness. Now, there's a warning here too, the word Repent. 
It's not saying, I'm sorry. You, you don't go to God and say, oh, hey, God, I got an oopsie. No, no, no. Let's call it what the Bible calls it. It's sin. Anything that goes against the holy God. Anything that goes against God's truth. What's God's truth? Well, God's opinion on any matter is God's truth. And so when we go against that and we miss the mark, the, the term comes from archery. When you draw back and sling that arrow and you miss the mark, it's called sin, sign. You miss the mark. And we get this weird picture, though, that we're all trying. You know, that's the picture we get. Oh, it's too bad. People are trying so hard and they just miss. That's not it. No, here's God's target, and we're running around going, woohoo, yeah, woohoo, let's just take 10 of them, aha, and we're not even aiming. The Bible makes it clear that we're not even trying. But by the grace of God and him doing a work in a life, we draw to him and see our sinfulness, our missing the mark. God's forgiveness covers our sin. I know most of you in this room have heard that. You've heard it from me probably dozens of times, but it's important. What I shared with you this morning is what I believe is a clear presentation of the gospel. Don't let anybody add anything to that. Don't let anybody take anything away from that. And that's just the beginning step for what Jude's talking about. Build your faith on a strong foundation. Are you sure of those things, believer? Follower of Jesus, are you convinced in your mind that, that what I said today is true from God's word? That's the start. Then know those things. Be convinced of those things. Contend for those things. When we have to spot a counterfeit bill, you know, U.S. government has some people that go around and they're in charge of, of currency. They don't bring them in and show them all the counterfeit bills so they can spot a counterfeit. They don't show them counterfeit bills in order to spot a counterfeit. You know what they do? They just make them study the real deal. They give them a real $100 bill and they make them study it. And when they know that $100 bill is authentic, then anything else that's not becomes very evident. Friends, I don't need to get up here and explain the difference between us and Muslims, Hare Krishna. I don't have to get up here and explain all the different religions' thoughts. You just need to know God's facts. Everybody say facts. And you need to place your faith in those facts. Everybody say faith. And we need to be forgiven. We repent of our sins. We don't just say oopsie. Repentance means an actual turn. That means we're walking one way in life, and when we repent, it means we actually stop and we get back on the right path. That's what salvation means. Are you saved today? That's the beginning building block. We're going to go deeper than that. We're going to go into more of the other things that those false teachers taught, uh, and then we'll talk about what we should do about it. Thank you for listening today. Father God, in the name of Jesus, as the team comes to close us out with our song, The Blessings, our benediction for today after communion, God, I pray you'd bless us to be believers who are firmly convinced, thoroughly prepared to share the gospel at any time. Help us to know the good news and help us to be convinced of it. Help us to contend for it. Help us to study Jude with an eye to understand that we need to be prepared. We need to be ready. We need to be vigilant. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us for the benediction today.
shine upon you this week. God bless. Go in peace.